Lord tonight. Amen. I'm glad I'm not in the hospital. I'm glad I'm not in hell where I deserve to be. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. If you open your Bibles, please, to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, we're going to look at verse 12. <clears throat> I am excited, a little fearful. I know God has not given us a spirit of fear, but it still doesn't keep me from pondering and sometimes worrying about things. But then I ask the Lord to help me with the fear that I do have that comes up. Uh, we could be on the very cusp of the Lord saying, come up hither. That's right. And I hope so. I really do. Amen. I really do. Uh, but if you have your Bibles, uh, Philippians 1, verse 12, if you have your place, please say amen. amen. This is one of the prison epistles where Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. And he's telling them, but I would, you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Let's pray. Yeah. Father, I thank you. Lord, I'm not always grateful at the time that things happen in my life. But Lord, I thank you for everything that you've brought me through, that you've brought me to. Lord, I'm thankful that you have never forsaken me and that you said that you'll never leave me. Lord, I'm thankful that we have great examples as the Apostle Paul who devoted his life, no matter the risk, he always used every occasion to tell others about you. Father, thank you for this wonderful example. Father, thank you for the opportunity we have tonight to open your word. Lord, in hopes that you are already here, because, Father, we've gathered in your name. But, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word tonight. Father, we need encouragement. Father, we need strength. Lord, there are uncertain days ahead of us as far as we don't know the details, but I'm glad that you already know every single detail. I'm glad that there is nothing that has caught you by surprise that is taking place in our lives today. Lord, I'm glad that no matter where we're at, whether we're in the church house, whether we're in the hospital, whether no matter where we are, you know exactly where we're at and you're there with us if we're saved. Father, I just pray tonight that you would expound the scriptures to us through the Holy Spirit. Father, that you would give us that comfort, that encouragement that we need. Lord, even if we need chastisement, I pray that you'd bring that tonight. But Father, help us to be attentive unto your word. Help us to look at the example that we'll be looking at tonight, the examples actually. And Father, help us to realize that you're still not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Father, help us to realize that no matter what we're going through, it's still better than what we truly deserve tonight. Father, it's easy to say from the pulpit, it's easy to say when times are good, but Lord, should bad times come upon us or should trials and, and tribulations come, Father, help us to remember tonight what we're listening to, what we're reading from our dear brother, from the Apostle Paul. And, Lord, the other verses that you have placed on my heart to share tonight, I pray, dear God, that you would just help us. We need you, dear Father. Lord, I am nothing without you. Father, I cannot even try to bring this message without your help. I need you, Father. Lord, I hide behind the cross. I, I plead the blood tonight that the Holy Spirit would have free reign, that he would guide my tongue, and, Lord, that I would be obedient unto him. Father, that you would receive honor and glory, and that we would lift up the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. Lord, should there be someone here tonight that's not saved, Father, I beg you to work in their heart, to draw them to yourself, that they might be saved tonight. Father, for those that are listening, help us to pay attention to your word. Help us to realize everything is under your control. We ask these things in Christ's name for his honor and glory. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Thank you so much for standing. I'm glad that we're in a church that we do reverence the word of God. I'm glad that we do stand for the reading of the Word of God. I believe it does make a difference. And I believe that when you honor God's Word, God will honor by giving us exactly what we need. When we show others that we reverence this, this book, as they would call it, it's more than just a book. These are the words of life that we need. Amen? We need this more than bread. We need this more than daily sustenance. This is our daily sustenance. 
And I wouldn't imagine trying to live a day without the Word of God. In fact, the days that I get too busy and I forget to read a portion of the Scriptures, I feel miserable all day. I don't know about you, but that's just the way I am. I need the Word of God. And uh, I hope that you do too. And I hope that if you've come to that place in your life where you don't want to go a day without spending some time in God's Word and fellowship with Him because it's so vitally important to us. But when you look at verse 12, I'm glad that the Apostle Paul, who wrote this in prison, is writing unto you and I. Of course, he was writing to the church of Philippi, but it is also to you and I today. And he said that he didn't want them to be ignorant. He wanted them to be able to understand. And he points out, there's a, a comma right after understand, and then he goes on, brethren, comma. He takes time to pause to speak to you and I who are saved because, brothers and sisters, we need a word of encouragement. Brothers and sisters, we need God's word to help us, especially in these trying days. We are living in perilous times. Now, thankfully, listen to me, you think it's bad here. There are brothers and sisters around the globe that are going through worse things at this time. Please do not think that we're suffering more than others. We're not. We still have it very well here in the United States of America. We do, honestly. But when we see that he has written this while being in prison, we notice that his focus is not on his circumstance. His focus is not on the unjustifiable reason that he has been placed in jail. Because this is all a fulfillment of Christ's promise to the Apostle Paul that he would go to Rome and that he would be a witness in Rome. Would you turn with me to chapter 4, please? Chapter 4, verse 22. I'm excited about this verse, and I hope that you are as well. The more I read the Bible, the more excited I get when I see things to start to click and come together. Amen? Amen. Because it helps me. It grounds me more in the faith, and I hope that it will help you. But when the Lord promised Paul that he would make it to Rome, there were times that it didn't look like he would make it to Rome. There were people who wanted to assassinate him. There was one time, and I'll get back to this in the message a little bit later, that he was stoned even unto death, I believe. But yet God resurrected him or gave him back his life. Because he still had things for Paul to do. And that should be an encouragement to you and I. If we're still here, God has something he wants us to do. Amen. We need to seek it out. Amen. But look at verse 22. At the end of this epistle, he writes, he says, All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. Where was Caesar? He was in Rome. Where did God tell him he was going to go to be a witness? He was going to Rome. See, Paul, through all the things that he went through, he is explaining to the brethren, if you'll go back to verse 12, he said, The things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. How many of you have ever been in a self-pity party? Woe is me. Amen? Woe is me. We get into a self-pity party. Well, that's just not just. That's just not fair. Because we've lost sight that what is fair is that I deserve to be in hell. And then I start to think a little more of myself than I should. And I think, well, that's not right. They shouldn't treat me that way. And then I read about the Apostle Paul. He's in jail. He's happy. Why? Because he's doing what God has called him to do. Do you realize the happiest place you will be is in the center of God's will, doing what God has told you to do? Amen. It doesn't matter the surrounding circumstances. It doesn't matter what's taking place, how unfairly you've been treated. If you are doing what God has told you to do, you are going to be a happy person. Amen. And that's easy to say when things are going good. Amen? Amen. But we need to understand that the Apostle Paul is a wonderful, wonderful example to you and I that things are going to happen in our life. Suffering is going to happen. But he said that all these things happen for the furtherance of the gospel. In other words, so that the gospel could get out to more and more people. And this is what we need to look at. 
This is something that we need to try to focus on tonight because many things happened to him after his salvation that he chose, and it is a choice, brothers and sisters, he chose to use them as an opportunity to open his mouth about salvation to those that he was trying to reach. Always to the Jew first, even though God called him to the Gentiles. He used every single opportunity he could to try to preach Jesus Christ. That is a great example for you and I. Amen. It's a great example. Now let's think about some of the things that he suffered. And of course, you'll find this in 2 Corinthians. He suffered beatings. And yet, he counted it joy that he suffered for Christ's name and for his sake. Amen? He suffered being in prison. I've already covered it. He was in prison while writing this. Yes or no? He suffered being stoned, being cold, being naked, shipwrecked, lost at sea, in pain. He suffered hunger. It says he suffered watchings. That means sleeplessness. Many times he couldn't sleep because of the situation that he was in. And we'll talk about one here in just a little bit that it brought about an opportunity for the gospel to be shared with somebody. Yeah. Think about that. Yet Paul, through all the things that I can read in the New Testament, I do not find Paul saying, I can't believe God allowed me to go through that. He never accused God of allowing him to be wrongly treated. Do you know why? Because he remembered where God had saved him from. He remembered what he was before he got saved. Right. He remembered how he persecuted Christ. Yes. How that he persecuted the believers. Yes. And he knew that he deserved nothing but the lowest place in hell. Right. In fact, he called himself the chief of sinners. Right. Amen? Amen? And because he always kept that in mind, he never lost sight of that, he decided in his heart that no matter what he was going through, it was worth it because yes. of Jesus. Yes. Have I arrived to that point yet? I want to, but I know what that includes. I know what I'm setting myself up for, if you will, if I make that public. Amen? How about the sons of thunder? Lord, who's going to sit by your right-hand side? Who are you going to appoint to sit next to you in heaven? He says, you don't know what you're asking for. Amen? He said, are you able to take the cup that I'm taking from? And they said, oh, yeah. Be careful of your boastful boastfulness. Be careful of what you say. Oh, yeah, I'm ready for that. Because they had no idea what they were going to face one day. But God saw them through it. Just as he will see you and I through whatever he brings us to. How many of you believe that tonight? How many of you will believe that if you wake up at ICU tomorrow? I hope I will. I hope I will. Amen. It's, like I say, it's easy to say when things are going great. But I hope when the test really comes that I will be able to stay faithful to the Lord because he is worthy. He is worthy. But when he was suffering these things, he never accused God of treating him wrongly because he always wanted to bring God honor and glory. He wanted to make sure that people knew about his Jesus, his Savior, the one who paid it all for all mankind. And that's what we should do, brothers and sisters, because our human nature won't allow us to volunteer ourselves to willingly suffer. I don't look forward to pain. Do any of you? I don't want to say, hey, arrest me so I can witness to people. I'm glad for a jail ministry where you can go from the outside and preach to people inside the jail. Yeah. Amen. Amen. What about a hospital ministry? Lord, give me pneumonia so I can go with it. No, no, no. I wouldn't willingly volunteer for that. But if it happens, I hope that I will have the right heart and the right mindset that I'll be looking for opportunity, as Paul did, to witness to people and tell them about my wonderful Savior. Amen. Don't you want that too? I know that you do. I'm sure that you do. But we must choose to use whatever comes our way to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ and also to be an encouragement to the brethren. Amen. How many of you have passed through something in your life? It was a difficult time. It was a trying time. 
but God brought you through it and then all of a sudden you met another brother or sister that went through the same thing and you were able to give them encouragement yes. you were able to give them counsel because you have already been through that isn't that a blessing yeah. or maybe you're in that situation you're suffering and someone else says you know what I was in this situation let me tell you how the Lord helped me has that happened to you Boy, I tell you what, I'm thankful for the experience of other brothers and sisters yes. who were able to help me through hard times. Amen. Because we need it. That's why it's so important that we forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. Are you listening to me? Amen. We need this fellowship. We need this time together. I know that things are frightful out there. I know that fear is out there and, and it's abundant, but God has not given us the spirit of fear. Amen. And when we start finding ourselves to be fearful, and it's easy to be fearful, especially today, turn immediately to God and say, God, give me a sound mind. Father, remove this fearfulness from me. Because it's not from him. It's from Satan. Amen. It's from Satan, and we must realize where it's from. Now, when you think about the Apostle Paul and all the things that he suffered, he just said, Lord, here's my life. It's a blank check. Take it. Use it however you see fit. And... Wherever God told him to go, he went. Wherever God said, don't go, guess what? He didn't go. And we need to be that way. But because of the situations that he was thrown into, I want to give you some examples of people that he was able to witness to. I'm not going to go to the verses, but I'm just going to pull out their names because I'm trusting that you've been reading your Bible. I hope you have. But you should be familiar with this. How about he witnessed to kings? King Agrippa. How about that? In fact, King Agrippa said, Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Yeah. Boy, wouldn't you love to be able to witness to a king of this world or a president to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ because Christ died for them as well? And Christ would have them to be saved? Can you imagine what it would be like in the United States of America if we had a truly born-again president? I believe we have a vice president that's truly born again. Yeah. But could you imagine if both of them were truly born again? How this nation, boy, Satan would be mad. The liberals would be mad. But God would be so pleased. Amen. But I want you to pray for our president. Amen. Because if nothing else, he's making some wise decisions yes, based on what the word of God says about Israel. In fact, he called for today to be a day of prayer in our nation. Because whether he knows Christ as his Savior or not, he believes that God exists. And at least he had enough sense to know that we need prayer to get through this crisis Amen. that we're in. Amen. Are you praying for your president? Yes. Amen. Were you praying for the president four years ago? Uh-oh. Do you know the Bible commands us to? Hello? It doesn't matter if they're our party or if we like them. We're to pray for all those that are in authority. We need to understand that. It hasn't changed a bit. God hasn't changed a bit. But he witnessed to King Agrippa. Oh, what a glorious opportunity. Right. Now, here, I showed you chapter 4, verse 22, where he says, those of Caesar's household salute you. Mm -hmm. It's quite possible that he actually witnessed to Caesar himself. Think about that. He was in Caesar's household. What did God send him to Rome for? To be a witness. Did he get no witness to Caesar? I kind of believe that he did. Can you imagine what would happen had Caesar received Christ? Right. Boy, how the world would have changed. Yeah. But God knows everything. Yeah. At least he probably had an opportunity to hear the gospel. Amen? What a blessing. Then there was Festus. Boy, Festus, he, he called Paul mad. He called him crazy. Why? Because of his belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, amen. And because of the steadfastness of Paul, even though he was in prison, even though he was really a prisoner, he had some freedoms, yes, but still Festus could not understand. Why is this guy not giving me a bribe like I really want to have? Why is this guy continuing to tell me about Jesus? It's because Paul was a true believer. Amen. It's because Paul really knew the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And his idea was not to try to impress Festus or King Agrippa. His chore was to please the one who saved his soul Amen. by telling others about him. 
And that's what we need to be doing. Then there was a warden. He got to witness to a warden, and the warden got saved. Remember when I said he had sleepless nights? Remember when he, Paul and Silas, were in the jail? And they were in their chains and singing, Woe is me, God has forsaken me. That isn't what they were doing in the jail at all. They were singing and praising God at midnight. He wasn't sleeping, he was praising the Lord. And then all of a sudden the Lord sends an earthquake and he lets all the prisoners go free. And the Philippian jailer is about to kill himself. Do you remember the story? Acts 16? And here he is, he's about to kill himself because we know what happened to the other warden that let the prisoner escape, Peter. He was put to death and his family. But here, when the Philippian jailer is about to kill himself, Paul says, do thyself no harm, we're still here. What happened? The Philippian jailer says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, well, you've got to repent. You've got to make sure you go to church. Oh, we, 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 we need to make sure you got some money for the offering. That's not at all what they said. I'm so glad the Bible makes it very simple and very clear. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Amen. Amen. When we think of this, because of his suffering, because him and Silas, while they were unjustly in the jail, while they were uh, not being treated fairly, instead of moaning and groaning and complaining against God, they were singing his praises. They were talking about how good he was. And because of that, a man who was their enemy now has become their brother in Christ because of their faithfulness yes. to the Lord. Amen. Would to God that I would have the same fortitude, the same courage, should I find myself in the same situation. I want to be faithful like Paul. Amen. Do you tonight? Do you want God to use you to be a light to others? Yeah. You say, Brother Beck, I don't, want to, I don't want to go to jail. Or Brother Beck, I don't want to be shipwrecked. I don't want to be shipwrecked. But the truth of the matter is we must prepare ourselves that we're just going to serve God no matter what comes our way. Because if we don't make that decision today, we're more than likely not going to make it when it actually happens. Let's make that decision tonight. Amen? I want to encourage you to do that. So he witnessed to the Philippian jailer. He got saved. Then how many of you remember when they were heading to Rome and their ship just got completely disintegrated? in the storm at the sea. And they ended up going to the island. And there they met Publius, who was the chief of the island. Now, while they were there, they were gathering wood. How many of you familiar with the story? They were gathering wood for a fire. And out of that wood came that, that viper, and it bit Paul. Yeah. And they're like, oh, he thought he escaped justice. They, they probably believed in karma, you know. They said, oh, watch here. This guy's probably a murderer, and he did not escape any justice whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And just shook it off. Nothing happened to him. Then they said, oh, he must be a god. Boy, isn't it, isn't it funny how we humans just go from one extreme to the other yeah. in our thinking? Well, they didn't die. They must be a god if they're not a thief, if they're not a murderer. But what happened is that God used this opportunity for Paul to be shipwrecked, to be located on this island amongst these heathen, and all of a sudden, there's a man with a fever. And God used Paul to be there at the exact time that he was there to call upon the Lord to heal him. Amen. That he was able to be a witness for Christ to the islanders where he was at. Boy, wouldn't you like to be on a ship that's being torn apart in the sea? Wouldn't you like to be able to know that you could drown at any moment? But wait a minute. Why is God allowing you to go through this? Yeah. See, we don't know the why. We just know the what for. God has brought us to situations in our life for a reason. God is allowing us, just as he allowed Job, to go through what he was going through, to go through what we are going through, and it's not for us, it's for others. Because 
How many of you have ended up being in a place that you weren't planning on going because of circumstances, because of hard times or trouble, and just so happens there was someone there that you were able to speak to about the Lord? Think about this. Because we don't volunteer for these bad things to happen. But God might just have a person there waiting on us. They don't know it yet, but God does. Just like the Ethiopian eunuch out in the middle of the desert where God took Philip away from a revival, where God says, hey, I, I, want you, I know things are going good here, but I want you to go out to the middle of the desert. He didn't say, what for, Lord? No. He said, okay. He left a revival. Who wants to leave a revival? Preachers? Do you want to leave when revival is getting on and it's going good? Do you want to say, well, i got to go, guys? No. But Philip ran. And he was there. And lo and behold, here comes this chariot. Lo and behold, on that chariot was an Ethiopian eunuch who had just returned from worship in Jerusalem. Was reading the book of Isaiah. And just so happened to run into Philip in the middle of the desert. See, God has a divine appointment for everything. And we must, must, must learn to get our eyes off of the situation. And, and boy, I am preaching to me right now. We've got to get our eyes off of that situation, that uncomfortableness, that, that, that feeling of, I, I don't want to be here. But wait a minute, God has brought you to it. Amen. Yes, it's easy to preach. Trust me, it's as easy to preach as it is for me to take it in right now. But... Why does God have me? I don't say, God, why would you allow this to happen? I need to say, Lord, what am I here for? And that's something I've got to still learn. I've still got to work on. But I, I pray that you'll pray for me that I'll be able to do that. And I'm praying for you that you'll be able to do that. Because there might be an Ethiopian eunuch that needs to be saved. Amen? Amen. There might be a chief of the island that needs to get saved. There might be a jailer who is in charge of our bonds. Who before may not have treated us well, but wants to know now how to be saved but boy if we don't behave ourselves if we don't live for Christ the way we should and these people are watching us we're going to close that door of opportunity that God has opened and we ought not to do that we need to do the very best we can to take every opportunity and I'm not saying that I always do it that's why I'm asking you to pray for me it's a hard message to preach we ought to take every opportunity my wife's going to hold me accountable you can believe that and Daniel will too Whatever situation we come to, let's look for that person, that opportunity that God is providing so that we can share the gospel with a lost person or maybe even and encourage a brother or sister who are struggling. Because that's what we need. That is exactly what we need. And as we think of that, all the things, Paul, he looked at them, he saw them, and you know what? He may not even have liked it when it happened at the moment, but he always looked for God's leading in these situations. And God always used him, not against Paul's will, but because Paul said, Lord, use me. Paul, Lord, what would thou have me to do? That was his first response when he met Jesus. When he got saved, Lord, what would thou have me to do? And that ought to be our daily desire, brothers and sisters. Amen. God, what do you have in store for me today? Lord, how can I be a blessing to others? How can I tell others about you? Lord, bring that person into my path. And I do pray this. Lord, bring that person into my path that you want me to witness to. Do you pray that way? We should. Or Lord, help me to be a blessing to others today. You know, many times we're saying, Lord, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. How about, Lord, help me to be a blessing? Amen. Lord, help me to please you today. That's what we need to do. And God will help us. Now, have you ever heard the question, why do good thing, or bad things happen to good people? That is such a misinformed question. How many of you realize that Paul was a great man of God? And the way that most humans look at it, we would say, well, that just wasn't right. Paul shouldn't have suffered all those things. But, you know, he said that his life was dung in comparison to the cause of Christ. Did he not? He saw that the higher calling was whatever Christ wanted. It didn't matter what he was going through. 
And yet we have people today who claim to be Christians. They say, well, why do, do bad things happen to good people? Did Jesus suffer? Yes. He was the perfect Lamb of God. No sin. He did everything the Father wanted him to do, but he suffered. Are we better than him? No, no way. Are we better than the Apostle Paul? No, no way. So why do we come up with questions, even in our own hearts, why do bad things happen to good people? The question is, there's none good, no, not one. And so that question has no merit in and of itself, if we believe the Bible. Would you turn with me to Romans chapter 8, please? Romans chapter 8. You may even know where I'm going to. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. I, I guarantee you this is a very familiar passage of Scripture. But we've got to pay attention to what words are in these verses and why they're there. Amen? Amen. Now please understand tonight that I'm talking about things that happen to us not because of a result of sin. Because there are bad things that happen to us as a result of sin. God's chastisement. Hello? Aren't you glad for God's chastisement? Yeah. If you don't know what it is, I want to encourage you to get saved tonight. Yeah. Amen. God will chastise his children. But what I'm talking about is things we're doing the best we can. We're living for the Lord and all of a sudden things come into our life that we say, well, what's going on here? Why, why is this going on? Well, let's look at Romans 8.28. Are you there with me? And we know that some things work together for good... What? Oh, y'all actually read the Bible? Amen. Boy, isn't it, isn't it helpful when we actually read what the Bible says? And we know that all good things, I'm still wrong, huh? There's no qualification on all, it just says all. All things work together for good. Woo. To them that love God. Hello. To them who are the called according to his purpose. Are you the call tonight? You say, well, God's not called me to preach. No, he called you to be a witness. See, the Great Commission was given to the church. Hello? Yeah. That was given to every believer. You shall be witnesses unto me. Amen? When you think about this, here, the Apostle Paul, once again, writing on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says all things, good, bad, ugly, doesn't matter, Pleasant, unpleasant, all things work together for good. For good to just anybody? No. Pay attention. For good to them that love God. Hello? Do you love God tonight? That's between you and him. But there's an easy way to show it. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If a man love me, he will keep my commandments. Right. Now, I can say I love God all night long. I can say I love God all the time in the pulpit. I want to, but if my life does not reflect that I love God. And by the way, I may be able to fool you some of the times. I can't fool him not one time. No. Amen. Amen. He knows whether I love him or not. And I know if I love him or not. Amen. And I want to love him more. I want to give him the love he deserves. But here it says, work together for good to them that love God, who are the called according to his purpose, his will, his plan, his desire. Hello? See, my will should be God's will. What I want should be in line with what God wants. If it's not, I'm the one that needs to change my want to. Amen? God's will should be my number one priority. God allowed his son to suffer for us. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. God was willing to let his own son suffer for our benefit. And Jesus willingly 
volunteered himself, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, before he created Adam and Eve, knowing that they would sin, he still created them. I, I don't know that I would have, but I'm not God. But he loves us so much, knowing what they would do, that he allowed them to be created still. He created them still. And yet he still provided a way for them to be saved after they sinned against him, knowing the truth. They didn't sin in ignorance. They knew. Adam especially. And yet God still loved him. God still allowed his only begotten son to be that sacrificial lamb on the cross of Calvary to pay the sin debt from, from Adam all the way until the last person that God breathes that breath of life into. He loves us, and he allowed his son to willingly suffer for us. Throughout history, God's people have suffered, but God always used it to open doors for people to have opportunity to know God and his salvation. Amen. How many of you are familiar with Joseph? Remember Joseph in Egypt? His brother sold him into slavery. Everything's just going bad. It went from bad to worse. And boy, he ends up in Potiphar's house. And while he's trying to do the best he can for Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, she throws herself at him and then accuses him of trying to attack her. And, and boy, he's thrown into the prison. And yet God brings him out eventually. And God puts him in a power or a position of authority. And lo and behold, those same brothers that sold him those same brothers who ignored his cries and his pleads for mercy and for help instead of exacting revenge on them. He knew that God had put him there for a purpose. He never took his eyes off of God, even though he unjustly was punished throughout his lifetime. And he even told his brother, they came to him trembling one day. And they said, now, Daddy said, don't, don't do anything to us. He didn't say that. But they were hoping he'd think it, Daddy said that. But he says, God meant this for good. Amen. He knew it. What about Moses? Boy, Moses, he was a good example. He suffered, but so that he was able to lead Israel out of Egypt. Amen? Think about that. We have the first five books of the Old Testament, the books of the law, because of Moses. Praise the Lord. But he suffered. Then you have Stephen. Oh, that deacon Stephen, that preaching deacon, amen? amen. Think about it. That's right. Who got saved after witnessing Stephen's testimony? Saul, who we call the Apostle Paul. See, the way we react to bad situations will affect somebody else. And if I call myself a Christian, if I tell someone I love Jesus and I'm saved, and they watch me respond wrongly to a situation, I'm going to turn them away from the Lord. That's right. But while he's holding the coats of those that are stoning Stephen, he is taking note. Now, he didn't like Stephen at the time. He said, get him, get him. I guarantee you that's what he was saying. Y'all need some more stones? Because he hated the followers of Christ. Yeah. He hated them with a passion. But he's holding the coats of those that are stoning Stephen. And then he hears his prayer, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, he may not have wanted to hear what he said, but it penetrated. And then when he's on that road to Damascus, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? I wonder if he had a glimpse of Stephen in his mind at that moment. Now, the Bible doesn't say, but you know, sometimes it doesn't hurt us to try to wonder what was taking place. But I guarantee you that testimony that he witnessed of Stephen was amen. burned deep in his soul. Yes, and God used it to let him see this is what a true servant is going to go through that loves me. And God, when he called Paul, he told him, you will suffer. You're going to suffer. But you know what? Paul didn't say, I don't want that. Paul gladly did what he did for the Lord Jesus Christ because he knew where God had purchased him from. Amen? How about all the others listed in the Hall of Fame? The Hall of Faith, if you will, in Hebrews chapter 11. Did you ever read in there that they did not receive the promise in, in this lifetime? Hello? That's right. But they received the rewards when they stood before him. 
They suffered, but willingly. They suffered, but they said it's worth it. Now that just does not make sense to our human carnal mind. When we, su when we experience suffering, I want it to stop. Give me a pain pill. Get me out of this. Instead, Lord, you've brought me here. What would you have me to do? Lord, is there someone you want me to talk to? You know, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is telling the disciples what's coming their way towards the end, when, right before the tribulation. He tells them what to expect. Pestilences was in there. Hmm. I wonder what we're seeing today. Amen? Are we seeing a pestilence today? Has the Bible proven itself once again? Isn't that amazing? Yet there's still people who deny the Bible. That's all right. They'll answer before the Lord. But let's continue on. Would you turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 7? You should know this. I trust that you know these verses. Now, to be honest with you, I've read 2 Chronicles many, many times, especially verse 14. How many of you read verse 14 many, many times? Boy, anytime you have a revival, that's where we're going. Amen. This is the verse. But I think it would do us good to read a couple of verses ahead as far as before verse 14. Amen. Are you there with me? Second Corinthians chapter 7. I like to begin reading in verse 12. When you get there, let me know by saying amen. If you need more time, say, woe is me. Second Chronicles chapter 7. I'm sorry. Y'all know I don't make mistakes, right? No, I make a lot of mistakes. Second Chronicles, thank you. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 is where we normally go to, but I'm going to read verse 12. Are you there with me? Yes. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, Ooh, I like this. I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. Now look at verse 13. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, well, we don't have to worry about that. We've had tons of rain. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land, well, we haven't had to worry about that, but Africa has been suffering through this. Hello? But if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, hello, here we are. Not only is it worldwide, it's here. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Wait a minute. And turn from their wicked ways. So God wants the lost to turn from their wicked ways. Is that who he's addressing here? He's addressing his people who are called by his name. And he's saying that they turn from their wicked ways. Woe unto us, brothers and sisters. That God would say there is wickedness amongst his people, but there is wickedness in most churches today. And we must turn from it in order for God to send true revival. See, revival must begin in the church house. Revival must begin with me first. Then I can expect it to permeate and affect others. But if revival doesn't start with me, I can't expect it to start for others. See, judgment will begin at the house of God. That's what the New Testament clearly teaches. But here God is saying, if my people, which are called by my name, what do we call ourselves? Christians. After whose name? Christ. Our Savior, the Messiah. Amen? The Anointed One. If we will humble ourselves. Boy, there's a lot of pride in churches today. Hello? Pray. How many times do you show up for a prayer meeting and there's no prayer? Hello? How many times have our homes been empty of prayer? See, the way that our home is affects the way the church is. It's inevitable. We must not only be prayers at church, we must be prayers at home. We must not only search the scriptures at church, it's good. We need to search the scriptures at home. We need to spend time in fellowship with God in our homes so that we come to church, God can continue that fellowship and speak to us further and give us more light. Amen. 
But if we have pride, if we're not praying, if we're not seeking his face, if we are not turning from our wicked ways, revival will not happen. We cannot expect God to bless us when we are disobeying him. We cannot expect God to continue to pour out his mercy and his grace, and he is long-suffering. His mercy endureth forever. Hallelujah! But still, he is a just God. He cannot deny his word. Judgment must begin at the house of God. But he is giving us a solution. And in verse 14, the key word is the very first word, if. If. See, it's dependent upon you and I, brothers and sisters. It depends on me making the right decision to get things kicked off. It depends on you to make the right decision to get God to move in our midst. See, when we come to church, listen, if you don't come expecting something, don't be surprised when you leave empty. We are always constantly praying, God, speak to me. What do you have for me? Lord, guide Pastor Lawson. Help him to have exactly what I need to hear. Or whoever's preaching, give them exactly what I need to hear, Lord, because I need to hear from you. Yes, I read the Bible, but listen, I need preaching. I need someone else that God's using to, to speak to me through the Scriptures so that God can do a work. I want God to do a work. I want God to use me. Amen. Amen. I don't want to be a castaway. But these things are happening. We see them happening. And God is offering us a solution to get back to him, to have the blessings again the way they should be, the way he wants them to be. Now, how many of you would say you're blessed tonight? How many of you realize we aren't as blessed as we could be? He's blessing us because he's his goodness. But he would be glad to open the windows of heaven. As he talks about in tithing, he would be glad to open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that we can't receive if we would just get right with him. If we'll quit moaning and groaning and complaining about the world's situation and start saying, Lord, help me to change the world by telling them about your son. God, put me in a place of someone that's closest to hell. And Lord, give me the fortitude and the courage I need to open my mouth to share the gospel. Because how many times have we judged someone unworthy to hear the gospel because we didn't like the way they looked? Because they didn't dress the way we thought they should dress. You say, we don't do it. Yes, we do. They smell. They're drunk. They're high on drugs. You think the gospel can't break through a drunkenness? Amen. Do you think the gospel can't break through being high on drugs? The power of God, it's limitless. We limit God's power through disobedience. I limit God's power through disobedience. But I don't want to do that. I want to let God flow through, through me and, and, and thoroughly and just use me however he sees fit. And I wish that was every single moment that I desire that, but it can be. It can be. I just got to be submitted to him always. And so do you. Amen? Let me ask you this tonight. Have you received the gospel? Have you been born again? If you died tonight, if God were to call your name tonight and take your life from you, where would you lift up your eyes? Would it be in the presence of the Father? Or would it be in the lake of fire, being in torments? If you've received Christ as your personal Savior, there's no doubt in your mind. You know that you know that you know. But if you don't know, tonight would be a great night to get that settled. Come, let us show you what God says you have to do to be saved. It is simple. Man tries to make it difficult. God had to make it simple because of man. Amen? That's true. Are you sharing the gospel as, as Christ has commanded the church? It's not just Pastor Lawson's job. It's not just the Sunday school teacher's job. It's not just the leaders that are around here's job. It's every single born-again Christian's job to tell someone else about Jesus Christ. Amen. Everyone. If you're born again, yes, God called you to be a witness. Amen. He commanded you to be a witness. Amen. Now, here's a question that we must consider. 
Are we looking at the storm that Christ has placed us in? Or are we looking at the Christ of the storm? Peter was doing great walking on water until he started looking at the storm. He took his eyes off of Christ. Now, we want to ridicule Peter for that. How many other disciples got off the boat? Not one. Amen. He at least got off the boat and walked on water. Oh, he had little faith. I wouldn't even get out of the boat. Amen. But at least when he did take his eyes off Jesus, he knew exactly what to say. Lord, save me. And after 20 minutes of floundering in the water, no, immediately Christ lifted him up. Are we any different than Peter? Would Christ treat us differently than Peter? No. God doesn't have favorites other than his own son. Are you listening to me? What God did in the lives of these wonderful examples that we have tonight, he'll do in our life. I'm not talking about the miracles. I'm talking about the deliverance or the using of us to win others to Christ. Amen. To be an example, to be an encouragement to someone else. God wants to use you for that. You say, you don't know me. You don't know me. I don't want to use me at times, but I'm glad God does. Hello? Because I know me. I know my failures. God knows them, and he still chooses to use me. And I'm thankful for that. But tonight, what's taking place in your life tonight? Are you going through something that no one else knows about? And you're saying, God, why have you forsaken me? He has not forsaken you if you're saved. Amen. And if you aren't saved, he's trying to get your attention that you need him. Hello? There are several that have written into the church lately. They, they say, God has forsaken me. I'm saved. I've been forsaken. That's a lie. God has not forsaken you. You may have forsaken him, but he says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. It is written forever settled in heaven. Amen. Amen. God is not a liar. Amen. If we think that God has forsaken us, we really ought to inspect ourselves. Lord, where did I get off the path with you? Father, when did I start walking contrary to where we were walking together? Because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hello? Amen. We're the ones that change. Amen. But when we find ourselves off that path, when we find ourselves thinking that God has forsaken us, it's us that have forsaken him. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Return to him immediately. Amen? We don't have to spend hours or years out in the desert. No. We can come right back immediately and restore that fellowship just like that. Amen. Do you want that tonight? It's up to you. Amen. There's other verses, but they don't matter right now because the Lord says it's time to quit. Amen. You can say amen to that. Amen. But the thing is, what's going on in your life? Are you seeking what God is trying to teach you or to use you for in this situation that you're going through? Or are you complaining and are you grumbling and saying, mur, 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 mur. God hates murmuring. Amen. God hates complaining, but we're all guilty of it from time or one time or another. Let's just thank the Lord. Hey, you could be in hell tonight. Anything you've got that's other than being in hell is pretty good. You say, Brother Beck, you don't know what you're talking about. I realize that, but I know what the Bible says, and I'm just going to trust the Lord. And so when I get in that trial and you find me complaining or grumbling, you say, Brother Beck, what did you preach on? Remind me, I need it. Amen? But let's focus our eyes on the Lord. Amen. Let's remember that no matter what has come our way, whether we're in the ICU, whether we're in jail, or no matter where we're at, God knows all about it, first of all. He allowed it to happen. We just need to find out what we need to do in this situation. And then submit to him to be used of him. Would you do that tonight? Would, would you just make up your mind to do that tonight with me? Because I've got to make up my mind every single day that I wake up, and even several times throughout the day. Lord, I want to submit myself to you again. Lord, I just want you to use me tonight. Father, I realize that whatever's going on is for the furtherance of the gospel. May God use us all. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. 
Thank you, Lord, that we have your written word, that we don't have to worry about what part is true, what part isn't, what part should we pay attention to. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Father, would you just please help us tonight because we need you, dear Lord. Father, we're going through a crisis in our nation. We're seeing things take place that we don't fully understand. We, we admit that you're in charge, but sometimes we forget that you're in charge. Father, maybe there's other instances go taking place in the lives of my brothers and sisters that are here tonight or those that are watching. Father, would you please be with them and remind them that you're right there beside them? Father, would you help them to realize that you're only a call away? You tell us, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Father, help us to realize you haven't changed. And if we feel that you have, it's us that have changed. Lord, help us to get back right with you. Father, use us. Use this church. Father, put a hedge of protection around us. We need you, dear Father. We can't survive without you. I don't want to have church without you, dear Father. Lord, please work in this time of invitation tonight. Lord, if there's someone that needs help, Lord, help them to be honest. <coughs> help them to come to this altar and ask you for help. And Lord, help us to pray for our brothers and sisters that might be in need of help right now. Lord, if there is someone here tonight that's not saved, Father, please help them to tear down those walls. Father, break through to their heart right now and help them to come boldly to you tonight. Lord, we know you want to save them. We know that you love them. Lord, bind Satan in his power right now that may be working in the heart of someone that's not saved. Father, give them freedom. Help them to come. Help them to come before it's everlasting too late. Father, I trust you for what you're going to do because it's your word, Father. We ask these things in Christ's name for his honor and glory. Amen.